friends. Welcome to episode 31 of School Librarians United. I am your host, Amy Herman. This podcast is dedicated to the issues and challenges school librarians face every day. As a school librarian for 12 years and counting, I found myself asking the question, where is the podcast that will help me do my job? I wanted a podcast which addressed the nuts and bolts of running a successful library program. I don't claim to have the answers, but I hope that this is a platform to share resources and exchange ideas. Now is a perfect time to mention that the ideas expressed in this podcast are my own and do not reflect those of my district. I especially want to thank those who contributed to the making of this episode, and that likewise, the ideas expressed during these interviews are our own. When incorporating research, I always cite my sources. So whether you are a novice or a veteran school librarian, this podcast has something for you. I am recording on Sunday, May 12th, and Mother's Day for many around the world, as I am discovering. I received not one, but two texts from my daughter, one yesterday wishing me a happy Australian Mother's Day, and because she is currently halfway around the world, today, a happy U.S. Mother's Day. I do hope the mothers and grandmothers and those of you who mother nieces and nephews and other children in your life feel celebrated and appreciated. This being May, it is also graduation season. Congratulations to all of you who are graduating from library school this month. I imagine as online degrees become more and more the rule rather than the exception, fewer library students will be attending an actual graduation ceremony. It is fun to see on librarian Twitter the pictures of graduates with their yellow hoods and big deserving smiles. Because my children were five and seven years old when I graduated, my cap and gown really got used more for a dress up and let's play pretend than for walking across a stage. I did want to extend a thank you this week to listeners in Brazil and China. Checking in on your episode download stats is a little like stepping on a scale. You aren't always going to like what you see, but this week... I was pleasantly surprised, and I'm really intrigued because this is my first listener in South America, and I now have a listener in China, and I half expected to get filtered out by the state censor. So, for better or for worse, the Chinese government has decided that what I have to say isn't a national threat for now. I would like to welcome you and all listeners to reach out. I appreciate your feedback and your episode suggestions, either on Facebook or Twitter. And my email address is schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com. If you include a mailing address, I'll be sure to send you a podcast sticker. Before we delve into today's topic, I would like to mention something that I did include in last week's episode. The episode's for the month of May will be devoted to wrapping up the school year. That being said, I'm also very aware that we are all on very different calendars. Schools in the United States are ending sometime over the next five weeks. Schools which use a year-round model and schools around the world are on very different holiday schedules. My hope is that whenever your school closes for an extended vacation, that you can find some resources and ideas to apply to your own program. The focus of this week's episode is summer reading programs. I will reveal my bias from the very start. I am a huge proponent of IRL in real life programs. Let's agree that there are a plethora of online summer reading programs out there on the internet. I don't want to presume that your students live near a public library branch. In doing research for today's episode, I found the National Education Association, or NEA's, Summer Reading Resource page. You'll find it to be very comprehensive and included research on the importance of summer reading, activities, various lists of recommended reading for all ages, resources to raise readers, as well as reading tips. I'll include a link in the show notes. In addition, uh, this webpage also included links to online summer reading programs such as Book It, which is sponsored by Pizza Hut, Scholastic Summer Reading Challenge, and Barnes & Noble's Summer Reading Program. There are, of course, other businesses which offer discounts, free food, and free books as incentives to students to read over the summer. 
In researching this uh, week's episode, I also came across another terrific resource, and I'll thank the School Library Association of New Zealand for this option for summer reading programs. They provided a step-by-step advice on how to implement this program in your school. Be sure to check out the link in my show notes because it was really uh, very descriptive and complete. I'm not sure how I managed to work in school libraries for the last 12 years and not have ever tried this in my own library, but the idea is that leaving our collections idle over the summer is a wasted resource. Said Richard L. Allington, co-author of Summer Reading, Closing the Rich-Poor Achievement Gap, quote, There is nothing more problematic for me than kids with no books to read and schools with libraries filled with books that no one will read over the summer. So my advice always begins with empty out your school library before the final day of school, end quote. Ironically, I've even had students ask me, Mrs. Herman, what happens to the books if the school is closed all summer? Well, Rather than collect dust all summer, the books go home with our students for extended checkouts. There are several options presented. In one iteration of this program, the students select their own bag of books. In others, the school librarian compiles 10 or more books in a special bag. These bags include fiction and nonfiction selected with each student in mind so that the titles are a surprise when the student is handed his or her bag. Also mentioned was to include brand new books to your collection, titles the students wouldn't have checked out during the school year. It's recommended the school librarian collaborate with a reading specialist and the grade level teachers to make these decisions about appropriate reading levels for each student's bag. Another fun suggestion is to include books to be shared with other members of the family to encourage a love of reading across the generations. In addition to books, the bags are also filled with treats, such as pens and notepads, bookmarks, and, because this is also Christmas time in New Zealand, holiday treats. These bags may also contain relevant reading lists and include information directed to the parents and caregivers, as well as promotions for the local public library. Some schools use questionnaires completed by students to decide which books to include, and it is important to mention that the students who wanted to participate needed to turn in signed permission slips because of the volume of materials being sent home with each student. I also found this resource valuable because it included the lessons learned as well as student feedback. Granted, an undertaking of this scale would require administrative support, some funding for the bags, and most importantly, allocated time for the school librarians to assemble the bag continents or coordinate times for students to select their books before vacation, and for the necessary follow-up once all these books are returned when school resumes. Also worth exploring is the National Library of New Zealand's School Libraries Encourage Summer Reading resource page. I included a link in the show notes. I really found the interface easy to use and appreciated the way school librarians can encourage families to join and use the public library. Because our district libraries are networked and are responsible for generating and issuing all student public library cards, we school librarians frequently reference our reliance on the public library system. But some of the recommendations in this article included making the public library registration forms available in the school, uh, along with other information when uh, individuals come looking to register for uh, school, as well as promoting library membership and the programming in packets for new parents and uh, in the school newsletter and the website, as well as listings for school events. Um, Furthermore, you're also encouraged as school librarians to talk about our public library, to show off our library card, and to talk about how we, as school librarians, also use the public library as a resource. And then finally, um, the recommendation is to take our students to the public library on a visit. Um, I do like this suggestion because two of our elementary schools are located across the street from public library branches, and we could schedule a walking field trip and allow for some additional time to get back and forth. Another fun and uh, practically free school-wide activity leading up to summer vacation would be a book swap. 
students are encouraged to bring one to two books in that they're willing to give away. We've done this using the lunch tables in the cafeteria to display the books which are being donated. Older students are paired up with the lower elementary class buddies to select books, and then we have an all-school read-in for 20 minutes. When it comes to how summer reading programs are implemented, all the stakeholders in education speak, that is, all the individuals in the schools, collectively have the same objective, to prevent the notorious and seemingly inevitable summer slide. We all wish to avoid losing the gains we've worked so hard to achieve with our students over the past school year. The administration, subject matter and grade level teachers, reading specialists, literacy coaches, and us, the school librarians who spend every moment of every single school day promoting the love of reading to our students, and we all want to impress upon them and their families the importance of reading throughout the summer. I did have a chance to confer with two educators in our district about their role in supporting summer reading. Both Beth and Stephanie have a dual role of reading specialist and literacy coach, and they service approximately 30 students each year. Stephanie talked about the importance of having a reading routine for all students of 15 to 30 minutes each day and explain to the students, just as you would eat breakfast and brush your teeth every day, so too should you be reading 15 to 30 minutes every day. As a literacy coach, Stephanie assists the principal in planning professional development for the staff and forwards reading resources to the staff to include in their newsletters home. In the past, Beth has always supplied a summer reading calendar to accompany the Readers Make Summer Plans unit in her Readers Workshop. She also forwards communications home regarding the Public Library Summer Reading Program. Because Beth recently changed buildings, she was still working on building relationships with the staff and elected to hold off on sending these materials out until she had a better sense of the building. And as somebody who is constantly switching buildings each year, I can completely empathize with the need to hold off on implementing new programs during the first year you're in a building. And appreciating all the while that each of our interested parties hope to impose our own reading expectations on our students. In doing so, we also have to be aware not to overwhelm our students with competing programs and packets and calendars and bingo cards to complete and reading logs to fill out. My preferred approach, rather than to reinvent the wheel, is to direct my students to the very best resources while our school libraries are closed for the summer, and that is to our public library branches. Partnering up with our public libraries is a great way to promote both of our libraries in the eyes of our community members. A rising tide lifts all boats. The more value our families see in the libraries located in their children's schools and in the neighborhoods, the more likely funding initiatives in local elections will be approved. Not surprisingly, connecting with students when school is still in session is by far the best way to recruit readers for the Public Library's summer reading program. Author Walter Minkle, writing for ReadingRockets.org, posted an article titled, Making a Splash with Summer Reading, which, while dated April 23, 2013, still has very important guidelines for public librarians in facilitating the success of their summer reading programs. And in nearly every one of these recommendations is an opportunity to collaborate with school librarians. Number one is to build better relationships with the principals and schools. The author admits that this is a challenge in contacting principals and teachers to schedule a visit. I know for a fact that collaborating with school librarians is the from the get-go will get you the scheduled visits that you need during this very busy time of the school year. The second piece of advice is to compile book lists with your school counterparts. Because our district is networked with the public library, we already rely heavily on our interlibrary loans throughout the year. 
I haven't sat in on generating school reading lists. I have, however, often referred our students to the public library when we do not carry the titles they want. While our elementary libraries offer many middle grade titles, it is not unusual for our older students to ask for upper middle grade as well as YA books. When that happens, I always show my students using the OPEC which branch offers those books and suggest that they talk to their grown-ups about checking these books out on their own. The third piece of advice is to join forces with other summer reading programs in the area. And I'll be honest, I'm not aware of any uh, competing summer programs, but in some states there are private as well as state-sponsored programs. The fourth piece of advice is to visit nearby schools. I have been the contact for this effort for the past five years for two buildings. Every school is different, but I will share with you what's worked with for me. Once I identify which dates work best with the school's main office, I email those dates to the children's librarian assigned to our school. We select dates during which we have no testing, no field trips, no assemblies, or lessons scheduled in the library. Needless to say, this is not easy. And with nine public elementary schools and at least five private schools in the neighborhood, the public librarians are assigned to several schools apiece. I generate a Google Doc with 20-minute time slots with room for three classes per time slot and share this out with the staff. That way, each teacher can decide which time works best for them and so as not to interfere with their recess or their specials times. In my experience, my teachers appreciate having that option rather than being told when their class has been assigned to attend the presentation. Because the public librarians are visiting the schools closest to their respective branches, there is also a good chance that these students will recognize them when they visit the library over the summer. The fifth piece of advice is interesting, and that is to do whatever you can to grab the parents' attention. And these recommendations are new to me, but they're really interesting. First of all, having an opportunity to make a really quick plug for your summer reading program during the the end-of-the-year awards assembly when parents are likely to be in the audience. Also, and I really like this idea, printing up stickers promoting the public library's summer reading program and putting those across the front of report card envelopes which go home with a student at the end of each school year. The sixth piece of advice for public librarians is to take advantage of summer school programs. And I've seen this work in northern Michigan, just outside of Traverse City. This area is covered with cherry orchards. And in the summertime, there are summer camps for the children of the migrant farm workers who come to pick the cherries each year. And those camps will schedule time for the campers to come and check out books from the local public library. The seventh recommendation is to schedule a follow-up in September, and this doesn't have to be done in person. In fact, this has more to do with acknowledging which students from that school participated in the summer reading program at the public library. One of my schools includes these students in a fall festival, and this is a celebration for the students who completed the take-home activity packet and or participated in the public library summer reading program. In addition, students who participate also have options to have their photos displayed in a showcase or the bulletin board in the library. Their names can be announced during the morning announcements and perhaps sent home in newsletters to all the families. And the eighth recommendation is that the summer reading program should give children free books. And why this may seem counterintuitive for libraries to give books away, it apparently never fails to win over fans. It is now my pleasure to share with you a conversation I had with two children's librarians working in with the planning and the implementing of the annual summer reading program for our public library. Hey everybody, I'm here today with two public librarians in our uh, community and I wanted to connect with them because I have very little understanding of the summer reading program, although as a parent I have benefited from it. Um, As a school librarian, what I really would like to do is to be able to support it and um, see how we can collaborate in bringing more and more readers to our summer program and to prevent 
the summer slide, which unfortunately happens um, despite many of our best efforts. So I'd like to uh, introduce them first of all and ask each one to tell me a little bit about their role in our uh, public library. So uh, the first person I'm going to introduce is Catherine. So Catherine, tell me a little bit about you and your job. Hi, um, I am a youth librarian and uh, specifically I'm working with the, the tween group which is sometimes a hard to define tween group, but essentially it's heading into middle school, going through middle school. Um, I do collection development for our library and programming and um, also story time too, not just really for tweens, but you know, when needed. Um, and generally help out in any way with each department that I can. Super. All right. Um, also here with me today is Jane. And I, I have worked with Jane. I've, I've probably known Jane longer because um, I actually tapped her for some help with my assignments in library school. So Jane, tell me a little bit about uh, you and your role here in this library. Well, I've worked here for uh, 23 years, 18 of which uh, were as a youth librarian. And I've done the story time, still do. And I did collection development. And of course, we do all sorts of other programs here for kids. And uh, both Catherine and I work at the reference desk every day. So we're pretty busy. So the first question I'd like to ask you is, how far in advance during the year do you and your fellow librarians start planning the summer reading program? Pretty far in advance. Uh, usually we try to have our the first meeting after summer reading program is all done, like our first uh, departmental meeting. You know, we try to recap what happened, um, what was well, what went well, and what maybe could use a little tweaking for the next year. Um, we try to have our framework, and like if we need to change anything, we try to have a good idea of what that framework is going to be by December. That's kind of like our one of our um, deadlines for ourselves. Um, start trying to nail down purchasing for any um, promotional materials. We follow the collaborative summer library program, uh, the National Program C-SLIP. So they um, have their own um, theme mm -hmm. and all the art that goes with that and some of the recommended uh, programming materials. Um, plenty of other libraries, you know, develop their own theme or stick with the same one every year. But we try to get those things ordered uh, by the end of the year prior to when summer reading starts. Um, so we start pretty early, trying to nail things down and get an idea of who we want to have for presenters, what kind of programming we want to have, just to get everything sort of laid out uh, ahead of time. It's still, There's still a lot of work that comes after that, though. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. And it makes sense to start as soon as the year ends because you can it's fresh in your mind and you can make those revisions and say, oh, well, next year I'm going to make notes for myself. This is what we're going to do when this is... <laughs> and you do. Yes, don't lose those notes. All right. Um, so, Jane, um, you know better than most. Um, we have three branches of our public library. We're extremely fortunate. Um, that's a program that's conducted on a very large scale. Can you tell me what goes into um, making sure you have that, that balance between the three branches? Well, each of the three branches plans its own individual programs, such as a magician or a live animal show, but we do have the overarching theme. This year is a universe of stories, and that's the sea slip theme. Those are determined a couple of years in advance, and this year is commemorating the 50th anniversary of Neil Armstrong walking on the moon, and there's a lot of special things that we can come up with with this. We have several science programs, probably at least five I can think of, and uh, we just like to look for things that do tie into the theme. But uh, each branch plans for those, but we always try to coordinate so that we don't have something at every branch on the same day. But people like to come every day and go somewhere, and our list keeps expanding for programming, doesn't it? And as far as summer reading itself, which is a little bit separate from all the programs that we do, uh, Families can come to any branch to log their reading and pick up prizes, or they log their reading on any computer. And we do have a club for teens, which is getting stronger every year. We have uh, reading for adults, too. So I always tell the kids when I visit their classes, if you're alive, there's a club for you. <laughs> you can sign up when you're one day old. And uh, all three of the branches work well. We're really in sync. 
That's fantastic. I, I think what's really exciting is that some of this you can do online because a lot of our families will be gone for some part of the summer. And that shouldn't be a reason why we don't do something. You should be able to, and I, I think that logging on and, and, and re recording our reading is really important when you can do that online. It gives the kids that immediacy mm -hmm. because I, I think that that is, is really important when you're, you know, nine. Okay. All right. So um, the next question I, I was curious to ask was, um, how do you get students uh, excited to enroll and participate in this program? Um, one of the more important things we do is actually is get into the schools and get some face time with uh, students during the during the school day and get them jazzed. Uh, quite often, that's with an awesome story time rendition. We get some interactive things going on with the kids as well. Um, in the past, we've been able to collaborate with um, the schools and uh, get some kids involved in a, creating a promotional video, um, which will run in the schools um, on their daily announcements or maybe once a week. I'm never certain about the, the, the timing at each of the different schools. Um, but letting kids see you know, their peers getting excited about summer reading, um, we try to plan programs that are interesting for kids. And uh, incentive prizes are part of it too. So, you know, we have the raffles and um, we have weekly raffles and then grand prize raffles. And we've got tons of free books uh, that kids can choose as they're going through. Um, and we make sure to mention those during our school visits as well. Plus we have, we've started doing a pretty big kickoff party. So that's like the, the culminating event or the, the opening event. Um, we have ice cream, there's bounce houses, um, face painters, entertainers. So we try to make a, a real big, exciting whoosh um, about summer reading. Um, is that scheduled the, the first full day that the kids are out of the public schools this year? It's, it's different. Um, we have, for the, the big kickoff party, we've traditionally done it um, the last uh, day of school. So it's a half day, and then our party is later that afternoon. Um, this year, we're actually trying something a little different. We're going to have it on a Saturday, and it's before school is done. Yes, we're, we're going to be doing it before school is done. We found, for some, especially the half day, there's parents who are working, and, you know, there may be someone to scoop up the kids after school, but they can't participate. Um, we're looking at if we do it after school is over. Some families leave right away uh, for their first escape for vacation for the summer. And um, so we decided to do it right when we start summer reading and uh, before school's over on a weekend. So this will be the first year that we do that. We're hoping we're going to see a lot more. Well, and the interesting thing is you compare and then decide if that's how you're going to go moving forward. All right, um, fantastic. Jane, you already mentioned some of the programs that you are um, uh, planning with the students that come and, and participate. Can you tell us some of the um, popular programs that you definitely want to make sure you include in your offerings this summer? Well, live animals are, are always a hit. I th we have animal astronauts, which is going to be a special thing. This year we have several uh, Jedi or astronaut-related demonstrations that are sort of special because of the theme. We have a uh, great puppet show. Uh, with, uh, you know, human-sized puppets is going to be fun. Uh, I'm just thinking of things right off the top of my head. I should have brought the list. Oh, yes, we have a several wonderful magic shows, a lot of crafts that the kids love. Um, last year we had Paleo Joe had a special exhibit of dinosaur bones at our Woods Branch for the whole summer so that the kids could come in and see that in addition to his uh, talks all about dinosaurs that he gave. So almost every day there are fun things for families to do and that doesn't include our story times that we have all summer and uh, some other fun stuff and many things for teens, right? Well, I know the parents really appreciate the entertainment that you provide their children because in the summertime, those can be very long days depending on the age of your children, um, especially when they are too young to go to camp. Um, so no, that's fantastic. I. Um, uh, I know that the parents are very grateful that you that you are so willing to entertain and do things that are exciting for their kids to do. Um, I do want to ask uh, two questions about what counts as reading because um, 
in the schools, oftentimes there's an issue as to what students can read that will count for an assignment. Uh, the question is, would audiobooks count towards uh, their reading goals? And would graphic novels count towards a student's reading goal? Uh, the answer to those both questions is absolutely yes, like times a thousand. Um, audiobooks, graphic novels, uh, you're engaging with story, you're decoding information, you're enacting your own imagin imagination because kids for summer reading are allowed to choose whatever it is they want to read. Um, so audiobooks and graphic novels, absolutely, they count towards reading goals. Music to my ears. I know there are a lot of kids who will find that to be very reassuring because there are times when that is their absolute most favorite way to consume books. I know with audiobooks, especially when we start doing the drive up north and you're looking at a five hour drive, the idea of, of an audiobook hey, wait a minute, this counts towards my summer reading. So that's, you know, all of a sudden you, you're accomplishing a great deal just sitting in the car. All right, uh, the next question is, um, school librarians want to be supportive in recruiting and promoting this public library summer reading program. How can we help you? Um, I know that my email box right now, unfortunately I'm guilty, you too have a barrage of emails from me trying to find times that our schedule will work, especially because this is a very busy testing time for schools. So we're trying to move around spring field trips and the testing windows, which unfortunately have, do not have the flexibility uh, that we would, we would like. Well, that was going to be my first uh, say, uh, item that really supports us, is that you do make the time for us to come and talk to the kids. And they love that. They'll walk into the library all over this, you know, at some point over the summer and say, you came to my library. I know you. And they listen when we talk. They're really engaged. And I always try to not mention the summer slide. I try to accent the fun part, that reading is fun, that getting prizes are fun, and we do all kinds of fun things. We, as grown-ups, are concerned about summer slide, but sometimes kids don't want to know that their reading level is going to drop <laughs> even though it's very important uh, but um, just the fact that you let us come to the schools means everything to us and I know that you also are very supportive as far as distributing our materials posting uh, our activities to your website and that's just invaluable also but the more you talk about it I think the more it helps us and I've watched over my years in the department uh, and seeing our relationship between the public library and the schools really uh, improve and uh, just it, it gets so great. Well, I, I have to say, I, I no bigger fan than me because you do help us tremendously. Um, just a little bit of background. First of all, our, our public libraries are, are the recipients of many happy community members' donations. I think that our community has always embraced our public libraries, and that is enormously important when it comes to funding. When I need a guest author, um, a lot of times the public library, their friends of the library, will bring in authors I could never afford. You know, a couple of years ago, Jennifer Holm came in, and I happen to know how much that cost. And there is no way any of our schools could have afforded that, but the, our, the generosity of our, our uh, friends of the library were able to bring in Jennifer Holm, and that auditorium that day was filled with my students and they were there not because I made that possible but because you made that possible um, I know that we refer to this as the big library and this is they like your library better because they can check out as many books as their grown-ups let them and so and I refer to this as the big library and I'm sure when you walk into our little libraries you're like oh isn't this cute but I refer to you as the big library and that also is where they can um, check out video games and I will show them on our OPAC that we share. We, we share a, an OPAC with the public library that they can check out video games and they can check out movies and all of a sudden their eyes light up and they're very excited. All right, um, I did want to, I did have a silly question here. Um, I'm aware you have a, a Biblio Bicicleta a, 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 that is the Italian word for it, I, I, but the, uh, the bicycle cart that you take. Could you tell me something about this, Catherine? I'd really appreciate it. 
Absolutely. Um, one of uh, our coworkers, Jane and my coworkers, um, one of our excellent youth librarians, she was one of the spearheads of getting our book bike. We call it the library book bike. Um, it's There's a couple different ways you can have a library book bike. I've seen some um, that it's just a trailer, that not, not just a trailer. It is a trailer that's hooked up to the bike. Um, ours happens to be kind of like, it's, like an ice cream cart. The company that manufactures it um, manufactures it primarily for, uh, you know, driving around town and selling popsicles. I think it is an ice cream truck. Oh, okay, there you go. Ice cream <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so we take that to events. Uh, we do uh, parks visits during the summer, um, go to the farmer's market. Um, we have block parties that request us. We just, in fact, this week we had another request for an event that's happening uh, at the end of June. Uh, different uh, organizations will ask for the book bike. Um, and it's just, it's so fun. I was, I, I told you that riding it, like you can't not smile and, and giggle when you're riding that thing. Cause it is just so fun when it's weighted down with books, you smile, but you eh, a little bit, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a very cool thing. Well, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, I really, really want to thank you for taking time out of your day. Um, this has been having three librarians in the room is, is unheard of. So this is absolutely fantastic. And I do want to thank you because I think that remotely we've always been supporting each other, but being able to sit together and talk about supporting each other um, because we all have the same goal. And that is to raise our readers to become lifelong readers. And it doesn't happen without you and it doesn't happen without me. So I really appreciate this opportunity. So thank you very much for meeting with me. I truly enjoyed meeting with my counterparts in the public library, and I hope to explore ways to collaborate and cross-promote our programs throughout the year. I also want to elaborate on the book bite conversation because I reached out to Rachel, who is credited with bringing the idea of the book bike program to our library. The first question I asked Rachel was, is there an official season when the book bike is in use? Rachel replied, it can be used year round except in inclement weather. And Rachel continued, I rode to a family outreach event at a local uh, middle school in the winter. Luckily, they're next door and there was no snow. The second question I asked was, can community members sign up for a visit? Rachel replied, quote, they can call our central administration office to request the book bike attend a community event. An example of this would be a few block parties we attended last summer and fall, end quote. My next question was, surface streets or sidewalks? And Rachel responded, quote, both, depending on the street. The bike is fun and easy to ride, just makes wide turns, end quote. I asked, what programming do you offer using the book bike? And Rachel replied, quote, right now we ride the book bike to all our parks all summer long as part of our parks events program. It also attends block parties and other community events like our summer reading kickoff party, as well as our farmer's market. The next question I asked was, can you check out books remotely? And Rachel responded, quote, yes. Uh, we pack books that we think will be popular for a given event, popular kids' books, gardening books, and the like, depending on the event. We also include library flyers, crafts, giveaways, and the like, end quote. So, in conclusion, I did want to wrap up this episode by mentioning the incentives that we sometimes include for participating in the summer reading program. While the public libraries have incentives throughout the summer, this also recognizes the importance of the schools in acknowledging our students' efforts to read throughout the summer. Nicole, an elementary school librarian in Missouri, offers coupons to a local restaurant or free passes to an indoor trampoline location. She also suggests recommending uh, displaying the students' names on a library bulletin board, giving them bookmarks, and also mentioning them on the library Facebook page, as well as putting them on the daily broadcast called KidCast. Nicole says her students especially respond to this KidCast because they all want to be YouTube stars. In one of my schools, a third grade teacher named Shelley has always coordinated our fall carnival. 
This celebration is held on the first Friday of the new school year. All the students who returned their summer activity packets are eligible to participate. And when we celebrate, we're acknowledging all the reading that they did over the summer. In addition, new students to the district, as well as incoming kindergartners and young fives, also join the festivities. These students get to choose from games in the gym, like cornhole and the rock climbing wall, hula hoops, basketball, and face painting. They also get to choose a treat, such as popcorn, snow cones, or a hot pretzel. If you don't regularly check the show notes, I encourage you to do so for this particular episode. You will find all sorts of resources to use in planning whichever approach to summer reading you decide works best for you and your school. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Just as a reminder, when emailing the podcast at schoollibrariansunited at gmail.com, please include a mailing address and I'll be sure to send you a sticker. I would like to thank you for listening today. The topic of our next episode will be Checkout has ended and the classes keep coming. Now what? I hope you will tune in.